Now I want to turn to the pattern of the ministry of Jesus in this particular aspect of deliverance from evil spirits. And I want to read from Mark chapter 1, a description of the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, beginning at verse 21, Mark 1, 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. The Greek says, in an unclean spirit. And I want to suggest to you that that man had probably been attending the synagogue like a good religious Jew for many, many, many years. But it says, and he, and if you read it carefully, it's not the man, it's the spirit. He cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now it's a remarkable fact that the demon in the man immediately knew who Jesus was. It took his disciples about 12 months to discover what the demon already knew. So we're dealing with people with supernatural knowledge. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet. The, the Greek says, be muzzled and come out of him. Now Jesus was not speaking to the man. He was speaking to the demon in the man. It's very important to see that. There comes a point when we don't deal with people, we deal with the demons in people, whether they're in us or in other people. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. You see, you have two persons. He, the demon, came out of him, the man. So there was more than one person there. There was the man, and there was the person of the demon or the evil spirit in the man. And Jesus did not deal with the man. He dealt with the demon in the man. And he was not embarrassed. Now, that kind of behavior took place in some churches, including Pentecostal churches. You know what they do? They'd lead the man out and put him in the basement and let one of the deacons take care of him. And I'm not theorizing, I've seen that happen. Thank God we don't have to take the man out of the church, we have to take the demon out of the man and let the man stay in the church. Then it says they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, what, saying, what is this, a new doctrine? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I want to point out to you that Jesus was not first acknowledged as the Son of God or the Messiah. What first attracted people to him was he had power to deal with demons, and that caused his reputation to go all around that whole area. And then we read a little further on in verse 32 to 34. Now at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Now demon-possessed is a bad translation because the word possessed suggests ownership. If you're demon-possessed, then you're owned by a demon. Now, I don't believe that any born-again, sincere Christian can be owned by a demon. I do not believe any sincere, born-again Christian can be demon-possessed. But the Greek word that's used can easily be and should be translated demonized. And I do believe that many born-again Christians are still demonized. That is, there are areas in their personality where the Holy Spirit is not yet in complete control. There's a demon that has to be dealt with. And Jesus did it. They brought to him all who were sick and those who were demonized. And notice, they didn't really come for, heal for, for deliverance, they came for healing. But in receiving healing, many of them needed deliverance from demons. And then it goes on, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak or to say that they knew him. You see, the demons all knew who Jesus was. And he cast out many demons. How many of you have cast out many demons? How far are we up to the standard of Jesus? How far are we below the standard and the pattern of Jesus? You say, well, 
they were not Christians. That's true, they were Jews. But actually, they were living basically by the law of Moses. And in most cases, they were living much more righteous lives than most of the people in the United States today. They, the penalty for adultery was death. If that penalty were imposed on the American population today, we'd lose about a quarter of our people immediately. Is that right? I'm not exaggerating, am I? So don't say, well, those were people that didn't know righteousness. Many people say, well, I'm sure there are people who need to be delivered from demons, but they're in prisons or they're in lunatic asylums. That's not true. Demons actually can be very comfortable in many churches. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout, throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. He did two things. He preached and he cast out demons. He didn't just preach. He preached and he dealt with the people's problems. Regular part of the Christian ministry. It's a regular part of the ministry of Jesus. It's not something extreme or fanatical. It's just doing what Jesus did the way he did it. Let's look for also in Mark, in Luke 13 for a moment, verses 31 and 32. On that very day, some Pharisees came to Jesus saying, get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he, Jesus said to them, go tell that fox, that's Herod. And he was not really too polite in some respects. Go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. In other words, Jesus said, all through my earthly ministry, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to cast out demons and I'm going to heal the sick. He started that way, he continued that way, and he concluded that way. That is the pattern of the earthly ministry of Jesus. I personally have no ambition to improve on it. If I can do even small part of what he did, I'll be satisfied. Now, there's a very important significance about this particular ministry of casting out demons. If you read the Old Testament, I think you'll find that almost all the miracles that were performed in the new were performed in the old. They raised the dead, they healed the sick, they fed multitudes. But there's one thing they never did. They never cast out demons. You cannot find an example of it anywhere in the Old Testament. And in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28, Jesus said, and if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So his casting out of demons was a distinctive sign that the kingdom of God had come. It was a miracle that was not performed as far as we know in the Old Testament. It's a distinctive declaration the kingdom of God has come. And really the casting of demons is war between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus demonstrated the victory of the kingdom of God by casting out demons. Now, let's read the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 10, verses seven and eight, we don't, can't go into the background, we don't have time, but he said this, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So Jesus said, you've got to do four things. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That was part of their total ministry. Everywhere they went, now you say, Brother Prince, have you seen the dead raised? The answer is yes, I have. In East Africa, when I was principal of a college for training African teachers, two of my students died and were raised from the dead. And they each gave a very interesting testimony of what happened to their spirit when it was out of their body and what happened when the spirit returned to their body. I just say that because some people say, well, people don't raise the dead. The answer is people do raise the dead. They don't raise all the dead but they raise the dead when it's God's purpose that the dead should be raised. All right, so let's take those instructions once more. Verses seven and eight. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. However, it is not enough to preach. You have to demonstrate the validity of what you're preaching. 
So Jesus says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Four things. One of them is casting out demons. And then in Mark 16, at the end of the gospel record, Jesus gave final this instructions after his resurrection to all who were to go out and preach the gospel. <clears throat> Mark 16, beginning at verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow or accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Let's stop there. How many have heard about speaking with new tongues? Everybody here. It's a very popular subject. But how many have heard about casting out demons? How many have seen it practiced? The first supernatural sign was not speaking with tongues, was casting out demons. You see, we have kind of gaps in our theology and our practice. We do some of the things and not others. But the way Jesus told us to do it is the right way. Now let's consider how they obeyed. During the earthly ministry of Jesus, in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, he had sent out 70 or 72 to prepare the way before him. Then they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That was the thing that excited them most. You see, that was the new thing. Healing was not new. Miraculous provision was not new, but to have authority over demons in the name of Jesus, that was exciting. And Jesus said to them, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do not get frightened. Demons have no power against a true believer who understands his rights. I wanted to just give you a brief description of what demons are as I understand it. My understanding is limited, uh, but I'll give you the best I have. I think the best thing to say is that they are persons without bodies. Demons have real personality. They have distinctive personalities. One demon is not exactly like another. I remember something so vivid. I was dealing with a man his wife had come to me and said, Brother Prince, my husband needs deliverance. And I made a mistake. I prayed for him on the basis of what his wife asked, you see? I never have done that again. If he needs deliverance, let him tell me he needs deliverance. Well, I started to pray for the man and he started to get violent. And his wife drew me aside and said, Brother Prince, at home he throws chairs at me. So I said, well, why didn't you tell me that before we started? <laughs> Anyhow, the demons were speaking out of the man, and one of them said, I'm unclean. And I thought, now, I don't want to embarrass the man in front of his wife. I could think of all sorts of unclean things that might be the problem. But I said, you, you spirit of unclean thoughts, come out of the man. He said, that's not my name. <laughs> I said, come out anyhow. He said, that's not my name. I mean, you can't easily understand how much of an individual a demon is. It wanted to be recognized by the right name. Well, eventually it came out, but the last thing it said before it came out was, that's not my name. I, I'm trying to impress upon you the fact we're dealing with real persons with characteristic attributes. I've already pointed out, but I'll say again, two things. First of all, the word is not devil. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, which means a slanderer, and is a title of Satan himself. The things we are dealing with are daimonions, demons, and they are not devils. They are another kind of being. Where do they come from? Well, I don't believe anybody has an absolutely authoritative answer. In my thinking, the most probable explanation is they are disembodied spirits of a pre-Adamic race that perished under the judgment of God between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. I mean, we may be wrong, but that's the best that I can come up with. But the most distinctive fact about demons is they desperately crave to occupy a body. 
They are not satisfied until they get inside a body. Preferably they would occupy the body of a man or a woman. But rather than be disembodied, they would rather go into the body of pigs. Because you remember the man of Gadara, the demons said, send us into the pigs. We don't want to be disembodied. What they didn't realize was that going into the pigs would cause the death of the pigs and they were left after that with the same problem again. But what I'm trying to deal with is you're dealing with a person who hasn't got a body and desperately craves to be in a body because, as I believe, only through a body can they exercise their ungodly lusts. If it's a demon of alcohol, it has to have a human throat through which to consume. If it's a demon of sexual immorality, it has to have sexual organs through which it can operate. If it's a demon of hatred, it has to have emotions that it can play upon to work through. In other words, we are surrounded by an invisible host of persons without bodies, desperately craving to occupy bodies and desperately struggling not to be out of bodies. How do they come in? And my answer is usually through a moment or a place of weakness. The devil searches for the weak moment or the weak place to come in. Now, what are the moments or places of weakness? This is not an exhaustive list, but it will give you some understanding. First of all, prenatal. Many infants are born with a demon in them. And it happens because of something that the mother did or didn't do. And the greatest single problem that exposes children to demons, unborn children, is involvement in the occult. And I want to say, you cannot get involved in the occult in any form without being exposed to demons. There was a proverb that used to say, he, he who sups with the devil needs a spoon with a long handle. I want to tell you there is no spoon made with a handle long enough to make it safe to sup, sup with the devil. This is what God says about the occult. That is involvement with any kind of spirits that aren't spirits from God. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. When you enter the land your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. So the first kind of person is those who actually make their own children living sacrifices, presenting them in a furnace to the god Merlin. And I want you to understand, it's very important, all the other practices that follow are in the same category with offering your infant as a sacrifice to Monarch. God doesn't put any distinction. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery. You know what divination is? Fortune telling. It's trying to discern something supernaturally by a spirit that is not from God. Every fortune teller is a diviner. If you've ever been to a fortune teller, you've been exposed to a spirit of divination. I remember dealing with a woman who needed spirit, deliverance from the spirit of divination. She said, I can't understand how it ever came into me. But I discovered that in the newspaper, she regularly read the horoscope pages. That's all you need to do. Who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, which is rampant in the United States today, from the top of the nation downward, from the White House downwards, witchcraft is rampant. Or who casts spells, or is a medium, or a spiritist, or consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Anyone who does any of those things is detestable. If you go to a fortune teller, that's detestable. God puts it in the same category with people who offer their infants in sacrifices to, a, to, a, to an evil God. You might say, well, what's wrong with the occult? I'll try to explain it this way. When you get involved in the occult, you're making friends with God's enemies. And God takes note of that.
and you have to repent and you have to cancel any involvement if you want help from God. I have another very common demon that enters unborn children is the demon of rejection. Um, see, every little baby comes into the world craving one thing more than anything else, which is what? Love, that's right. But you see, the mother has got too many children, she hasn't got enough income, she discovers she's pregnant, and she regrets it. She doesn't have to say anything. She just says, I wish I didn't, wasn't going to have this baby. That baby is born with a spirit of rejection. Now, this is true of my second wife, Ruth. She was born in the height of the Depression in 1930. She was the eighth child, and her mother was already struggling to feed the seven previous children. And without saying anything, the mother resented having another mouth to feed. And Ruth had to be delivered from a spirit of rejection. Thank God we knew what to do and she was wonderfully delivered. But rejection is one of the commonest demons and it enters very frequently while a person is still in his mother's womb. Then there are pressures in early childhood. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says this, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So in a strife-torn, disharmonious home, the children, born or unborn, are automatically exposed to demon. And most children do not have strong enough defenses to keep the demons up. So any child born in an unhappy, strife-torn, divided home is exposed to demons. How many such homes are there in the United States today? There are many, aren't there? See, parents are responsible to maintain an atmosphere in their homes in which the children can grow up free from demonic mol molestation. But very few parents in contemporary America are doing it. That's one reason why I wrote my book, Husbands and Fathers, because the number one failure in American culture is the husband and the father and everything ultimately revolves around him. It's wonderful what wives and mothers can do, but no wife and mother is a substitute for a father. And the greatest single need of America today is men who are real fathers. Amen? Now, don't, please don't mis misunderstand me. When I say we need fathers, I'm not saying we don't need mothers, but that we have more good mothers than we have good fathers today. But many, many children in contemporary America are exposed to demons in early childhood, and most of them do not have the spiritual defenses to keep them out. Then there's what I call emotional shock or continued emotional pressure. Um, I remember a woman telling me once she needed to be delivered from a spirit of fear. I said, how did it enter? When she said, I was standing on the sidewalk and a terrible accident happened in front of me. And at that moment, I was seized with fear and I realized the demon of fear entered me. Now, let me give you a scripture about that. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. This is speaking about Christian women. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. So to be a daughter of, of Sarah, you have to be not afraid with any terror. You have not to give way to sudden emotional shock. But if you do, it's very possible that a demon will enter. Another way that come, they come, which is obvious, is sinful acts or habits. If you continually indulge in a sinful act, repeating it, sooner or later, and maybe sooner than later, the demon of that act will enter you. If you continually in, give way to sinful habits or foolish habits, let me talk about one that nobody talks about in church. So because people don't talk about it in church, church girls have to go to a psychiatrist for help. But I'm talking about masturbation. 
Now, some people say masturbation is natural, it's not evil. I don't agree, but you're free to have your opinion. But what I do know is there are masses and masses of people who regularly masturbate and hate themselves for doing it. And they say never again, and a little while later they're doing the same thing again. Now that is a demon. It's a demon of masturbation. And because I don't want to embarrass you later, I'll tell you how it will come out. It will come out of your hands and your fingers. And you feel this tingling in your fingers. Your fingers will begin to go stiff and maybe bend backwards. I've seen this happen many times. A person will come up to his brother and say, I don't say what, understand what's happening to me. My fingers are tingling and they're bending back. I say, you have a demon of masturbation. Hate it and get rid of it. And I want to tell you, masturbation will not go out unless you hate it. You have to really hate it. And you might say, I'm a married man and happily married. Thank God you are. But I have cast a demon of masturbation out of a man of 50 who was married. But he still was a slave to masturbation. And let me speak to you frankly for a moment. What happens when a married partner has a masturbation demon is the satisfaction from the sexual act that the other person should get goes to the demon and not to the person. Can you understand what I'm saying? I hope you can. I'm trying to be frank without offensive. And then there's another very, very common way that demons entered, enter, and that is through idle words. And I want to read to you what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 about idle words. Verse 36. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. People often say, well, I didn't really mean it. That's exactly what Jesus says. That's an idle word. Any words you speak you don't really mean are idle. And whether you intend it or not, one day, unless you repent, you're going to have a, give account for them in the Day of Judgment. Every idle word. People so often say to me, well, Brother Prince, I didn't really mean it. I said, that's precisely what it is. It's an idle word. It's a word you didn't mean. And I cannot tell you how many people I've dealt with who have a spirit of death because they invited it in. They got depressed or discouraged and said, well, I might as well be dead. What's the use of living? I'd be better off dead. That's all you have to say. The demon of death is right there in front of you. It will enter many times. I'm not saying always. It gives you some idea of the way that demons come in. Now I want to list characteristic activities of demons. Number one, demons entice. They entice us to do evil. They entice us to sin. Take an example. You're walking along the street and somebody's drunk their billfold full of money. And a voice says to you, an, an, an inaudible voice says, pick it up. You might as well. If it was yours, they would do it. Why don't you? Well, anything that can speak is a person. And behind that inaudible voice is a person. And that person is enticing you to do evil. You may not follow it, you may resist. But nevertheless, that demon is there trying to get you to do something which will expose you to him. Then demons harass. And the example I always think of is this businessman who's had a terrible day in the office. The air conditioning failed. The secretary did the wrong thing. He had a client who was complaining and threatening to sue him. When he makes it through the day, he gets into his car to drive home and there's an accident on the freeway. And he sits there for one hour without air conditioning on the freeway, stewing. And I mean, he's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. He gets home and what happens? His wife is late with the supper. The kids are running around screaming. And as they say in America, he blows his stack. And at that moment, the demon of anger enters him. See, it's been following him around all day, just waiting for that moment of weakness to come in. And after that, he's a different person. He still loves his wife and children dearly, but from time to time, something comes over him that causes him to do things that harm those he loves the most. And from time to time, when his wife looks into his eyes, she sees something that was never there before. What has happened? The demon of anger followed him all day, 
and chose the weakest moment and the weakest place and jumped in. Demons defile, they're dirty. They're all called unclean. They make you feel unclean. They fill your mind with dirty, unclean attitudes, emotions and thoughts. Particularly if you're planning to read your Bible or worship. Anything that attacks you at a moment like that is probably a demon. And you, you never feel really pure. You can sing about the blood of Jesus and how wonderful it is, but there's something in you that doesn't respond. Demons defile. Demons torture. Jesus says in Matthew 18, the, the one who will not forgive his brother or his sister, what's the, the sentence? Deliver him to what? To the torturer said. That means you and me. If we don't forgive, if we retain bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, the sentence of Jesus is to deliver him to the torturers. Who are the torturers? Demons. Very simple. They torture in many ways. They torture emotionally. They torture with fear, with guilt, with uh, some kind of uneasy feeling that you haven't done the right thing, but you can never put your finger on it. They torture you physically. I've dealt with many people who've been delivered from a spirit of arthritis. To me, if you look at arthritis, that's demonic. It twists, it tortures, it incapacitates. Now, please understand, I am not saying that everybody who has arthritis has a demon, but many do. I recall a scene in South Africa some years ago when Ruth and I were ministering together. We were praying for the sick and a person, I think it was a woman, came up with arthritis. And I said to her, I, I want you to know I'm going to deal with this as a demon. And, Is that okay? She said, yes. Ruth and I prayed, cast the demon out and she was delivered. Well, then I thought to myself, why go through this process with everybody individually? Because everybody had seen and heard it. So I said, I believe that you can be delivered from the spirit of arthritis without being individually prayed for. So anybody, and it was a large congregation, anybody who needs deliverance from arthritis, will you stand up? Well, about 30 people stood up in different places. I played a spirit commanding the spirit of arthritis to leave them. Now I said to the people, don't sit down until you know you've been delivered. And we went on ministering, but after about half an hour, every one of those people had sat down. Later on, Ruth and I traveled in various parts of South Africa. We met several people who'd been the ones that stood up and sat down and they each testified they'd been healed. Now, please understand, I'm not saying all arthritis is demonic, but I, if you want to get a real picture of what demons are like, arthritis is a pretty good picture. They torment, they torture, they incapacitate, they bind. They are evil things. And uh, again, this, there are exceptions, but it's surprising how many people who suffer from arthritis have some kind of bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness in their life. I need not say no more. Please don't get offended if you have arthritis. It doesn't mean you have a demon, but if you do have a demon, get rid of it. Number five, demons compel. They make you do things you don't really want to do. I would say almost any act or habit that is compulsive is probably demonic, not necessarily. Demons also enslave. They make you slaves. Take the demon of alcohol. It enslaves you. You just cannot do without your glass of whiskey. You know it is harmful. You don't really enjoy it, but you can't help yourself. But people can be enslaved by other things. They can be enslaved by television. You know that. You can be an addict to television. Some television addicts walk into a room, the first thing they do, switch on the television. They don't know what programs are, they don't know what to watch, but it's, they're just as compulsive as a person who reaches for a glass of whiskey and drinks it. Now, put compulsion and enslaving together, you get addiction. And our contemporary culture is full of addictions. And I would say 99.9% .9 of them are demonic. <coughs>
Let me give you a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is, for me, the biblical definition of addiction. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. I would prefer to say beneficial. So all things are lawful. I'm not on any law which says thou shalt not eat and thou shalt not do this and that. But not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So overeating and sexual immorality are specifically mentioned by Paul as possible examples of addictions. And an addict is a slave. And I'm sorry to say the church is full of addicts. Not all of them are addicts, but there are many, many good Christians who are nevertheless slaves. Slaves of masturbation. Slaves of idle talk. Slaves of defiling habits. Slaves of wrong attitudes. Slaves of wrong eating and drinking. I have come to see that my body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And I'm responsible for how I treat that temple. I am not free to defile it. I'm not free to do anything that would make it less good than it should be. I am very careful about what I eat and what I drink. I'm not under any law, but I try to honor God's temple. How about you? Are you taking care of your temple? If it were a physical, material temple, you'd be very careful about it, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd keep it swept. You'd keep the windows clean. You wouldn't let dust accumulate. You wouldn't let the toilet get clogged. What about your physical temple? How well are you maintaining that? What about coffee? Coffee is a drug. I mean, everybody knows that. Now, I'm not saying you're an addict, but I'm saying do this. Just stop drinking coffee for 48 hours and see if you're addicted or not. You'll find out. If you come through, it's fine, all right. But if you cannot do without it, then you need to do without it. Paul said, all things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. And really, where it boils down to for modern America is eating and drinking. That's where we have to say, am I under the power of anything? And many, many good American Christians are slaves of their stomachs. They call it by the right name. And it's an addiction. And it's demonic. I'm not saying necessarily you need to be delivered from a demon, but check and see. And mind you, you won't be delivered if you want to keep on doing it. The final thing that demons do is they make weak or sick. And almost every form of sickness can be demonic. I'm not saying it is, but it can be caused by a demon. As I've said, arthritis is a very conspicuous example. Migraine is another conspicuous example. Almost anything that's torturing is demonic, I would say. Torturing and enslaving. Let me say something else about sickness. You know, I, I do sometimes pray for people, check their legs. How many of you have seen me do that? Anybody here? That's all right. Okay, and very often when I hold a person the leg and it grows out, the person will start to contort and twist and behave in a very strange way. And I've learned that it's a spirit of crippling. And I've seen many people delivered from a crippling spirit, something that twists, deforms, enslaves. And I thank God for chiropractors. I thank God for doctors. I'm not against doctors. But the best one of all, his name is Jesus, that's right. <clears throat> and here are the steps for receiving deliverance. Step number one, personally affirm your faith in Christ. 
The scripture says Christ is the high priest of our confession. It's our confession that releases his high priestly ministry. If we make no confession, he cannot serve as our high priest. He is the high priest of our confession. When we say the same about ourselves as God said in his word, we release the high priestly ministry of Jesus on our behalf. <clears throat> Step number two, humble yourself. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I have not found anywhere in the Bible where God says he will humble us. Always, God says, you do it. Humble your son under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Humility is a decision. And in this, in this ministry of deliverance, you may well have to make a decision between your dignity and your deliverance. And if your dignity is more important to you, you probably won't get delivered. People who are getting delivered are sometimes very undignified. But my advice to you is let dignity go and receive deliverance. Because after you've received deliverance, dignity will come back. I want to point out to you something very, very beautiful out of the scripture. There was one person whom God gave a unique honor, never given to any other person. That was to be the first human witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And you know who she was? Mary Magdalene. And you know what it says about her? In Mark 16. I want you to notice this. Mark 16, verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. It all goes in the same passage. So she was not inferior because she'd been delivered from seven demons. In fact, she's the first human witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had such compassion on her broken heart that he wouldn't even go to the Father until he revealed himself to her. To me, that's one of the most marvelous illustrations of the compassion of Jesus. There was one woman so brokenhearted, so much in love with him, that he couldn't even leave earth till he'd revealed himself to her. Who was it? Mary Magdalene. What was her testimony? He delivered me out of seven demons. Brothers and sisters, don't be ashamed if you should need deliverance. You could be ashamed if you let pride keep you from receiving deliverance. Number one was personally affirm your faith in Christ. Number two, humble yourself. Number three, confess any known sin. Don't search for sin, but if the Holy Spirit shows you an unconfessed sin, confess it. I, would, I think you'll find this is true. God has never committed himself to, con to forgive sins that we are not willing to confess. So you, if you want forgiveness, you have to be prepared to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But only if we confess our sin. Now you're not confessing in order to tell something God he doesn't know, because God knows all about your sins long before you confess them. What you're doing is bringing something dark out into the light. Because as I understand it, the blood of Jesus does not cleanse in the dark. You have to bring it to the light with all its embarrassment. But when you bring it to the light, the blood is applied and you are cleansed, whiter than snow. It's worth it. And listen, we're not talking about confessing our sins to me or to the pastor, just confessing our sins to the Lord. And after all, you're not going to be telling him anything he doesn't already know, because he knows all about it, but he still loves you. But it's his condition that you bring it out into the open. Repent of all sins. It's not enough to, to confess, you have to repent. The Bible says in Proverbs, he who covers his sins will not prosper. If you keep it covered, you will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. So you have to confess and then you have to forsake. You may have to throw it away. Whatever it is, you may have to throw it away. It may be expensive. 
but you may have to throw it away. Forgive all other people. Now this is absolutely essential. If you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. That's the only comment Jesus made at the end of teaching the Lord's Prayer. If you forgive sins, God will forgive you. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. You have to make, your mind, make up your mind. And let me say forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. You carry in your hand IOUs from somebody to you, maybe for, who knows, $10,000. But God in His hand has IOUs from you to Him for a thousand, hundred thousand dollars. God says, let's make a deal. You tear up your IOUs and I'll tear up mine. But if you don't tear yours up, I'll hold on to mine. I've discovered that the two commonest causes why people are not delivered is number one, unforgiveness, and number two, failure to repent. So you have to do it. Then you have to break with the occult and all false religion. That's essential. And you may have to get rid of occult objects that are in your house. Because God told Moses, if you bring them into your house, any accursed object, you will become accursed like the thing. Some of you got things in your house that bring a curse on you. Objects related to the occult, objects of superstition, get rid of them, have a house clean. Let me say one of the most dangerous and subtle forms of the occult is Freemasonry. If you have any relative or you yourself have in any way been involved in Freemasonry, break it off totally, absolutely, terminate it, get it out of the house, don't do, maintain any connection with it. Some of the most terrible cases of demonization I've seen have been associated with Freemasonry. Forgive all other people. Break with the occult and all false religion. And God warned Moses, said, if you bring any of those satanic objects into your home, you become a curse like them. Prepare to be released from every curse over your life. We're going to deal with that without going into it. Jesus was made a curse on the cross. That was the last thing that happened to him, that we might be redeemed from every curse and enter into the blessing of Abraham, whom God blessed in all things. Many, many people in America and Britain and Europe today don't believe in curses. They think they're superstitious. Believe me, if you go to Africa or Asia, they know curses are real. They're just as real here, but they're dressed up in nice, pretty clothes. So you can be released from a curse. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus was made a curse. That's the only basis of release. Take your stand with God. Come out on God's side. Say, God, I'm your child. I'm your servant. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I hate anything that comes between you and me. I don't want it. I'm for you. And number nine, expel. Now, that's very, very important because expel is not a religious word. I was looking for some word that wasn't religious. It's, it's in a certain translation of the New Testament. So what is expel? You've got something inside you that you don't want. What do you do? You expel it. You breathe it out. You blow it out. You sob it out. You cough it out. You scream it out, but you get it out. You don't keep it inside you. You see, this is so simple that religious people can't always do it, but expel it. I had a letter once from a woman years ago. She said, Brother Prince, never hesitate to tell people to breathe it out. She said, my husband went to one of your meetings, went up to the front, prayed like you told, blew out four times, and that's all that happened. But she said he's been a different man ever since. This is very real, see, it's not up there. It's right down here on the surface of Earth. So I want you to consider for a few moments what I've been saying. Open your heart and mind to the Lord and say to him, Lord, is there anything in me that I need to get rid of? Because I want it out. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. 
He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.